I'm going to preface this by saying that, you know, I'm not naming any names. However, one thing I've learned in a word to the wise, don't trust any bitch named Jen. Let me tell you something, bitch. Let me tell you something, bitch. Let me tell you something, bitch. The dick snapped harder than Judy Funny at a poetry slam. Let me tell you something, bitch. We are living in the aftermath of Reaganomics. Let me tell you something, bitch. Go eye for an eye with me and end up with astigmatism, honey. Let me tell you something. If you're going to listen to this podcast and you recognize my voice, don't play any of it for either one of my grandmamas, okay? They done survived this pandemic, and this might kill them. Let me tell you something, bitch. I remain anonymous to protect the guilty. Let me tell you something, bitch. Streaming everywhere. I sometimes read uh, public domain books here on Leaves of Glen. And they were written a long time ago, uh, so they're usually uh, racist or sexist or bigoted. Uh, But in there somewhere and all that is a a story, and that's why those stories are famous. Other times, I read uh, works from independent authors, and they're delightfully not racist, but they might have adult language or adult situations. So that's your warning, uh, but I'm sure... You uh, are grown up enough to handle it. Don't write to me complaining. How do I even describe what I bring to this show? The the kind of power and uh, gravitas that I... uh, A certain type of energy. My name is Glenn. It's uh, Glenergy. Oh, I'm bringing Glenergy to the show. I just thought of that. All on my own, without any help. Oh, oh, hello. Uh, welcome to the mansion of Leaves of Glen. Did you did you hear that promo at the at the beginning of the show? That is a show that uh, my kid and I actually enjoy on a regular basis. Uh, I first dipped into it because uh, the person was following me and I was following them on Twitter and I thought, oh, I've never listened to this show. I should listen to this show. So I turned it on and the speakers on my laptop were on and my kid was sitting across the table from me doing homework and all of a sudden you heard, uh, you want to hear about horrible roommates? Uh, Let me tell you something, bitch. And uh, my kid just started cracking up. And I said, oops, sorry, not trying to distract you from homework. And they said, you leave that on. You leave that on the whole time. So we listened to the whole episode together while they did homework, and I just, I don't know, looked at adult material. They, they don't have to know what I'm looking at on my laptop. So you should check that show out if you haven't yet. Uh, it's a good show. Um, this is where I read uh, the hottest in public domain books and short stories. Uh, uh, and I do this bit where I pretend like I'm in a mansion when uh, really I'm just recording in my basement. I've done this before. It feels hollow going through these gestures. Uh, this week, we're going to read the short stories uh, from the book 31 Horrifying Tales from the Dead by Drock von Stoller. I have a little history with Drock. Uh, back in 2014, my sister, my brother-in-law, and I, and sometimes my niece, we all got together and we'd read short stories uh, for a podcast, not just by ourselves alone in the, in the basement, uh, for, the, for the pleasure of you people, and nobody listened to it. So we eventually got bored and stopped doing it. But we started out by doing Drock Von Stoller, so I reached out to Drock and I said, hey, uh, do you care if we read your stories uh, for our podcast? And he said, nope, go ahead, have a good time. And we had a good time reading it. And then uh, later on we said, hey, uh, can we uh, read another one of your stories? And he said, don't even ask me ever again. You can read all my stories from now on. Just do it. And so we looked more into Drock. It turns out he is writing all these short horror stories and just pushing it. The man's got a business, and man, he works the business. But looking into him lately... I reached out to him again, probably just to annoy him, and say, uh, hey, can I read one of your short stories? Uh, thinking that he'll just say, stop talking to me, just do it. But uh, he didn't answer back, and uh, most of his websites are kind of dead, and there's nothing going on, and you try to contact him, and he doesn't answer back. And uh, and I'm just kind of worried about old Drock, because uh, he's not really out there anymore doing anything, and it's kind of got me a little bit worried, especially after the pandemic. So let's learn about the author from his own... Uh, uh, audible, or not audible, uh, 
Amazon page. I don't know what's happening to me. Drock von Stoller had his best year in 2020 with 554,593 downloads of his short stories. Uh, released on October 17, 2020, the Amazon Prime video Drock von Stoller's video anthology, uh, which contains Drock von Stoller as the host, featuring nine short films of titles Bloody Mary, The Babysitter, The Man Upstairs, The Clown, No More Mr. Nice Guy, uh, The Haunted Mirror, uh, The Doll, uh, No More Mr. Nice Guy, that was already there, uh, Dracula, he put that in twice, uh, the Legend Lives and Zombie Bride. Uh, link below. And there's a link. Uh, July 21st, 2020, uh, Drock Von Stoller reached 2 million downloads of his short stories. This is just kind of repeating itself. Uh, he's had another record-breaking day on October 5th, 2020 of uh, 3,638 downloads. Drock also had 100 of his short stories in the UK Top 100 Free Best Sellers in Teen and Young Adult Short Story Literature. Drock Von Stoller is a very good day on Amazon, <laughs> September 29, 2020. So in the, uh, I'm just going to let this go. Oh, thank God. Uh, since October of 2020, he's been silent, and it's got me worried. So I'm just going to go ahead and read this without his permission and hope for the best. Let's dive into the story. First up, uh, out of the two I'm going to read, because they're very, very short, uh, The Planchette by Drock Von Stoller. Uh, this is the new edition from 2019. During the 1800s, the planchette was a popular game in the parlors, which consisted of a, uh, a board of wood uh, with a pencil attached and, uh, and, and two wheels. Where the curious players would place the tips of their fingers on the board of wood, and if they were lucky, the spirits would guide the movement of their hands, creating words on the paper directly underneath the board. Now that uh, we know the meaning of the phrase planchette, this is where the story begins. Well, good thing we know that. Uh, Karen Facilli and John Deadman. Oh, that's foreshadowing right there. Uh, we're curious about the legend of the Talbot family misfortune surrounding the game planchette that became a family tradition on stormy nights. Yeah, but their, but their family tradition was about to take a tragic turn for the worse uh, that would cause each family member to have to pay with their own lives for conjuring up a demonic presence. Uh, Karen and John were, ah, well, they were both determined to find the planchette game at the Talbot's mansion. Why? Legend has it that after the last Talbot family member died, uh, one of the servants at the castle either tried to destroy the game by tossing it into the fireplace or hid it somewhere in the mansion or the family crypt. The most bizarre thing is that each family member's body was drained of blood and uh, their eyes were missing. Karen said, John, if we were to find the planchette game, we could stand to make a lot of money and become, oh, ah, famous. I would just think if there are blood stains around the game. Wow, with two exclamation points. That would be awesome, don't you think so, John? Who the hell is she? She's a horrible human being. Sure. Oh, that sounds great. But that's not going to happen to us. We're never that lucky, said John. Why does he think that it would be great? Oh, John, don't be such a, a doubting Thomas. Who knows? A, a doubting Thomas? What the hell's a... Is that a real phrase? Hold on. Doubting Thomas. As a skeptic who refuses to believe without direct personal experience, a reference to the Apostle Thomas, uh, he refused to believe that the resurrected Jesus had appeared uh, to the other ten apostles until he could see and feel the wounds received by Jesus on the cross. Wow, that's quite the reference for Drock. Good for him. Uh, don't be such a doubting Thomas. Who knows? This might be the break we're looking for to get us out of the dumps we're living in. Really? Finding this is going to make them wealthy? Said Karen. Oh, my hunch is. That doesn't quote me on this. Uh, but I think the planchette game is somewhere in the family crypt. What do you think? Karen asked. John replied. Yeah, I think the game is in the mansion somewhere in a, oh, oh, a secret passageway leading to another secret room that only uh, Mr. Talbot knew about. 
This all seems uh, very specific. They haven't even been in the house yet. Now already they got, uh, they're already planning out where these weird random places are that it could be. Uh, well, since we think the game is in two different places, then John, you, you search the mansion and I'll search the family crypt, said Karen. Sounds good to me, said John. And John and Karen got their flashlights. And as they both were headed off to their destination, Karen said, uh, uh, John, let's be back at the study of the mansion uh, with our findings eh, around midnight. John, my watch says it's six o'clock. Six hours later? Let's not waste any more time. I can't wait until our friends see our story in the newspaper. Oh, I can count those Benjamins now, said Karen. <laughs> Oh, don't count so fast. Uh, we haven't found one piece of evidence right now, said John. Oh, don't you worry. One of us is bound to find something. Uh, just just have a little faith, said Karen. Okay, fine. I'll, I'll do as you say. Uh, who knows? Uh, you may be right, said John. Uh, see you around midnight, Karen. Uh, good luck, John, said Karen. <laughs> six hours? They plan on spending six hours digging around. As Karen and John headed off to their destinations, the only thing that their friends would be reading about in the newspaper is two teenage kids were reported missing without a trace. Oh, more foreshadowing. Dead men. Uh, if the Talbots uh, didn't survive the demonic presence that drained them of all their blood and eyes uh, missing, what makes John and Karen think that they're the ones to solve the mystery surrounding the, the Planchette game? Oh, as John went exploring in the mansion, he said to himself, uh, if I were Mr. Talbot, uh, the best place to have a secret passageway would be in the study behind one of the bookcases. Ah, classic maneuver. Nice work, John. John headed down the stairs to the study, and just as his foot touched the last step, he heard what sounded like a, a low-pitched demonic voice telling him to get out, or or he would, he would die. Uh, the voice was so faint that he just thought that he had heard things and pressed on toward the study, hoping that he would be the one, not Karen, that finds the Platchette game and it gets all the credit for, for solving the mystery. Burp. If you hear any kind of voice, low-pitched or not, and it's demonic sounding, you, I don't know. All right, we'll just keep moving. As John's hand clutched the door handle, the door flung open. Oh, and a force pushed John into the study. See, these are reasons to turn around and leave. And the door slammed shut. Well, too late. John doesn't scare so easily, but it's got John a little scared. Oh, and he was starting to think maybe this was such a good idea after all. Well, you should have took the cue from the demonic voice, no matter how faint it was. Uh, but John uh, was in too deep. Uh, just like gambling debts. And there was no turning back. Oh, the demonic voice led John to the bookcase. Uh, it did. It kept talking to him. Tell him, like, go over there. No, go towards the bookcase. And he's doing it? I would not do it. Where the secret passage went. Oh, John paused for a moment and said, uh, uh, may Maybe I'm hearing things. Because Karen and I just had a little too much to drink just a couple hours ago. But I could have sworn that a strange voice led me to this bookcase. He just had the door sl All right. John shook his head and started Pulling books out from the shelves, thinking this would uh, open the secret passage behind the bookcase. Ah, uh, but to no avail. The, the, the demonic voice intervened and told John to turn the candle holder on the wall uh, to the uh, to the to the right, and this would open the bookcase, exposing the secret passage to Mister Talbot's mysterious past. But and just as the voice instructed John, the bookcase opened, so it told him to turn it, and then the the demon voice just did it anyway. Now, that's passive-aggressive. Uh, bookcase opened as he turned the candle. Uh, John just froze. He couldn't believe he heard a voice. But you heard it earlier, like three times. It told you to go to the bookcase. And that voice did lead him to the secret passage in Mr. Talbot's study. Nah, John was right all the time. Uh, John entered with caution, but he knew time was at hand. and He didn't want to uh, come out empty. John turned on his flashlight and went into Mr. Talbot's secret room. As John got further inside the room, the, the door slammed shut and the bookcase closed as tight as a coffin. Oh, but that didn't scare John. Ah, because his mind was set on finding the planchette game. Is that the secret to surviving any terrifying situation? Like, if you're in a war scenario, like a battle, and there's gunfire all around you, you just gotta focus on something weird. Like, uh, uh, I'm gonna see if I can 
steal Steve's helmet. Ah, and just focus on that. You don't care about anything else. Because that's what John's doing, and apparently it seems to be working. Uh, he shined his flashlight where the painting on the wall was hanging and lifted the art off the wall and noticed the wall safe was behind the picture. This has to be where the game was hidden all these years. How would you know? Why the wall paint? Again, the demonic voice told John the combination of the safe. <laughs> so that he turned the knob to the right uh, to six. They turned it back to the left uh, uh, to six. Oh, I can see where this is going. And then back to the right again uh, to six. But John had no idea the combination was demonic voice told him to use was the Mark of the Beast 666. Yeah, because he's so focused on the thing. It's just like the battle thing. I, this might be a way to get through stressful situations. John turned the handle on the safe and heard a click. And then the safe opened up. And, and lo and behold, a piece of the puzzle both John and Karen had been searching for was right before his eyes. Oh, John reached in and pulled out a piece of paper that was part of the game, uh, Planchette, just as Karen envisioned. And the uh, blood stains were present on the paper. Yeah, well, John's heart was pounding out of his chest. And he said to himself, oh, oh, I can't wait to show this to Karen. <laughs> she will probably drop to her knees. Oh, where's this going? But if we don't find the pencil and the wood piece that completes the game, uh, then this bloodstained piece of paper means nothing. Uh, it's a bloodstained piece of paper. <laughs> Gross. John rolled up the bloodstained paper and clutching his hand and hurried back to his secret passageway. I want to show Karen what he found, but little did John know that Karen wouldn't get the chance to celebrate what they both longed to see. Meanwhile... Karen was searching, so he can get out. No, I thought it closed behind him like a coffin. Karen was searching in the Talbot's family crypt uh, for any clue that would lead her to the planchette game. And just as Karen was about to give up, uh, her eyes were fixated on Mr. Talbot's coffin and said to herself, Ah, there's no way he would have buried the secret along with him, but would he? Karen glanced over in the corner by one of the family crypt and noticed a rusty crowbar. Oh, that's convenient, lying on the floor. Karen rushed over with excitement and picked up the crowbar and clutched it in one hand and, and hurried back to Mr. Talbot's crypt. Oh, Karen raised the crowbar and said, uh, Please let me find the planchette game inside Mr. Talbot's coffin. Karen wedged the crowbar between the top of the concrete slab and, and had just enough strength had to pry open Mr. Talbot's coffin. Oh, a pillow of smoke surrounded Karen's body. Uh, that was a demonic presence. Uh, but Karen was too excited about finding the planchette game that uh, nothing was going to get in her way. Well, uh, Karen's eyes just about popped right out of her head when she looked down and seen what was in Mr. Talbot's hands. Oh, my God. I can't believe what I see. It's the, the wooden piece and the, and the pencil that goes with the planchette game. Oh, wait a minute. Uh, something is missing. Oh, the bloodstained paper. It, it's got to be here somewhere. Well, Karen was looking everywhere inside Mr. Talbot's coffin, uh, but to no avail, no sign of the bloodstained paper. And then, uh, then all of a sudden, well, a force lifted Karen off the ground and threw her body in the tomb. Mr. Talbot's body was out. Uh, Karen was screaming uh, to the top of her lungs, uh, pleading to let her out. But the demonic presence would allow for that to happen. Because <laughs> the demonic presence is a no-nonsense kind of guy. He's just all about business. The smoke that surrounded Karen entered Mr. Talbot's body, uh, causing Mr. Talbot's dead body to come alive. Oh, the demonic voice of Mr. Talbot's dead body said, I, 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 Karen... And you didn't think it, it'd be that easy to walk away with Mr. Talbot's uh, planchet game, uh, now did you? Without a question mark at the end, an exclamation point. Karen was trying to break the hold of the demon's grip. Oh, but it was, it was no use. Then Mr. Talbot's eye sockets were glowing bright red, uh, and, and Karen couldn't look away from the glowing red eyes. Uh, Karen's uh, blood-curdling screams, oh, it could not be heard from outside uh, the outside world. And Karen's eyes were, were burning out of their sockets until they were no more. Then, uh, then Karen's lifeless body uh, went numb, and the demon proceeded to drain Karen's blood from her body. Uh, John, John finally arrived with his good news to share with Karen, because apparently the bookcase thing unlocked itself. But it was too late. Oh, she was dead. As John approached the crypt, uh, where Karen's lifeless body was lying inside Mr. Talbot's coffin, uh, he shouted, he shouted, uh, Karen, get out of that coffin. Uh, I got some good news to share with you. 
<laughs> well, there's no response from Karen. And then John shook her body with not as much as a whimper. Uh, John turned her body over slowly and said, No! Two exclamation points. No! Two exclamation points. What, what have you done to Karen? Where, where are her eyes? No! Exclamation points. That's two of them. No! Two exclamation points. The no space. No! Two exclamation points. Well, uh, the demonic voice answered. They're, uh, they're mine now. And I, uh, I drained all her, her blood like the, the rest of the town family members uh, that should have uh, left well enough alone. Eh. The demonic voice said, uh, Mr. Talbot used the planchette game to, to summon up one of his ancestors that uh, sold his soul to the devil, thinking this would uh, make him immortal. But I, the demon, uh, didn't want to be disturbed. So this is what happened to Mr. Talbot and his family and uh, uh, Karen. Uh, now that you know the secret, uh, will you soon join Karen and the Talbot family in the crypt for eternity? Period. Mr. Talbot's demon-possessed body leaped out of the coffin, uh, blood dripping from his mouth that uh, came from Karen's body, uh, grabbed John with a, that's good detail, uh, grabbed John with a, a grip of steel. Again, as, as he done to Karen, the demon stared into John's eyes, and John yelled, uh, My eyes are burning. Oh, my God, uh, you're killing me. <laughs> the demon drained John's blood out of his body, like all the rest. Oh, uh, the demon gathered up the pieces to the planchette game and, and returned to the coffin, never to be disturbed. As for John and Karen, they, they died along with the Talbot's secret. Well, with that, uh, why don't we take a little break? And, I don't know, that story kind of got me worked into a lather. Why don't we... uh? I uh, slip back up into the uh, master bedroom as I read to you the newest uh, upcoming romance novels from Penguin Random House Books. Oh, oh hold on. I'm coming. I'm coming. Just had to reheat the patty melt. Uh, oh, God, look at you. Yeah. You painted your entire body blue. Is it like the blue man? Oh, no, Avatar? Well, that is fantastic. I am impressed. But I want you to wash all that blue off your body. Uh, I want you to dress up like Brad Pitt. And I want you to keep saying, uh, I'm Brad Pitt. And Brad Pitt loves your, uh, loves your Glenergy. As I read to you uh, a new upcoming romance novel from Penguin Random House Books called, uh, uh, called Love Scenes by Bridget Morrissey. Uh, Love Scenes is a heart-stirring, tear-inducing read that you won't want to put down. Oh, Emily Henry, New York Times. Oh, a New York Times best-selling author of Ble uh, Beach Red. Another New York Times best-selling author. I've learned about this scam, but I'm not going to get into it. Acting like she's in love with her handsome nightmare of a co-star in a movie directed by and produced by her complicated Hollywood royalty family uh, in is Sloane's job. But what happens when the lines between script and reality get blurred? Out-of-work actress Sloane Ford is in desperate need of something to do after losing her steady TV gig. Uh, when her famous family ropes her into working as a producer on their World War II era romance. This is all over the place. They neglect to mention that the film will be headlined by Joseph Donovan, uh, her least favorite former co-star of all time. Oh, the roguish actor made her life a living hell uh, the last time they worked together, uh, using his movie star good looks and an Irish charm. Oh, I don't want to get into that. I used to be Irish. Uh, to cover for his erratic professional behavior. Oh, on the new film set, he promises he, he'd be different now. But Sloane is far from convinced. As filming gets underway, it becomes clear that anything can go wrong will go wrong. Oh, when the lead actress is abruptly fired, Sloane agrees to step in and take over the role. And she starts to remember why she fell in love with acting in the first place. Uh, oh, on camera, she and Joseph share an electric chemistry. Off camera, oh, they've been honing their characters and, much to Sloane's surprise, growing closer. Uh, but playing the role of a woman in love with Joseph Donovan is a dangerous business. And the more they spend time together, the less Sloane can tell what's real between them. 
and what's just for show. Yeah, that sounds hot. Uh, Love Scenes by Bridget Morrissey is uh, coming out in paperback uh, June 22nd from Amazon, Barnes & Noble, uh, Bookshop.org, Hudson Booksellers, IndieBound, Powell's, Target, uh, my favorite, Books A Million, I love that name, and uh, Walmart. Well, with that, it turns out uh, you, dressed up and acting like your Brad Pitt, doesn't do anything for me. You disappointed me again. Uh, so with that, why don't we go back to the library and pretend like this, this whole sham never happened. Oh yes, it's Ladies' Fright. We tell spooky stories and try to figure out what about them makes them so scary. Using personal anecdotes, psychology, and sociology, Lauren, Maggie, and Jackie dive into urban legends, ghost stories, and other tales that give us a good fright. Because this is Ladies' Fright. Oh, what a fright. Find us wherever you listen to podcasts. Oh, that sounds like a fun little show, doesn't it? Just a, a group of kids sitting around having a good time, talking about stuff. It makes you think, oh, I should sign up for them with my podcast app of choice by looking for Ladies Freight Podcast, except that they make fun of old Glenn and the way old Glenn talks. It, it, my Glennergy right now is white hot. Ang- Angry Glenn. They have an episode coming out in July where they, Jackie does an impression of me. I'm going to find out when this thing is released, and I will not let any of you listen to it. But you should listen to the rest of them. The show's nice. Okay, well, let's move on to the story. Next up, a visit from the Greys, in parentheses, Aliens, by Drock Von Stoller. Billy was always curious about the lights in the sky, but he didn't think much about them until June 14th, 1963. One night, on his dad's farm, he saw the lights behind the barn. Billy, being the curious type, put on his cowboy boots, a hat, and Lone Ranger holster. (laughs) This is very specific to cowboys. Ready to take the outlaws in. Oh, Billy was only 10 years old and didn't realize that the light... He was 10 and he had that kind of outfit. Realized that the lights he saw were something he should have eh, told his parents about. I'm not afraid of any varmint. I'll capture those varmints and take them to my daddy, and then I'll be a hero. Billy opened his bedroom window and climbed down the tree. He softly called for his dog, Trigger, to come along in case these varmints were hostile. Now, Trigger, be quiet. Uh, We want to sneak up behind these varmints, uh, tie them up with my lasso, and bring them alive to my dad. Billy and Trigger made their way to the side of the barn unnoticed. All of a sudden, uh, Trigger ran behind the barn and began barking at the intruders. Billy ran after him, calling out his name, and, uh, and when he reached the back of the barn, Billy froze. Oh, he heard Trigger yelp, and a beam of light came down from the sky. And in a blink of an eye, Trigger was gone. Uh, what have you, you, you done to Trigger? Billy cried desperately. Uh, who are you? And uh, where are you from? Well, there's no answer. Uh, Billy realized that the lights he saw behind the barn were more than uh, just lights. Uh, it was a, well, lights that aren't supposed to be there are weird to begin with. It was a, a silver disc that was being flown by gray-colored creatures about, uh, yeah, four and a half feet tall. Uh, you just wait until my daddy finds out about this, Billy yelled to the creatures. Well, he tried to move, but he couldn't. Uh, there was some sort of force field around his body that, that kept him in place. Uh, The two aliens got out of the craft and approached Billy, and they escorted him to their ship with plans to experiment on him. Uh, One of the aliens uh, pointed a device at Billy, and a beam of light encased his entire body. As as the alien uh, slowly raised the device, Billy's body levitated off the ground and slowly turned to a horizontal position. Uh, the two gray aliens approached Billy and, and pulled out some uh, silver spirits. Oh, they pierced his body and extracted a uh, fluid from his spine and, and other areas. Uh, Billy tried to cry out, uh, hey, You're hurting me. But no words came out of his mouth. He was paralyzed while the two gray aliens experimented on him. 
When the aliens were finished, uh, they lowered Billy back down to the floor of the spaceship. A bright light inside the spaceship flashed uh, for a brief second. Uh, and the next moment, uh, Billy was lying on his bed with no recollection of what had just happened. Billy uh, felt really tired and weak, so he slipped into his pajamas and quickly fell asleep. On oh, the next morning, Billy went downstairs to get some breakfast before school. His parents asked him if he'd noticed anything uh, uh, strange last night. Uh, no, Billy replied. I just remembered I was feeling tired and uh, weak. Oh, yeah, your father went looking for Trigger, but there's no sign of him anywhere, his mother said in a worried tone. Uh, where do you think he went, Billy asked. Oh, this farm has a lot of wooded areas. Uh, Trigger's probably chasing a, <laughs> yeah, a rabbit or some other animal. It will probably show up soon, his mother replied as Billy's father, Jack, came back into the house. Uh, oh, hey, Billy, he said. Uh, were you outside playing around the barn last night? No. Why do you ask? Well, I was looking for Trigger and ran across your Lone Ranger holster <laughs> behind the barn. Uh, there's a large burnt spot on the ground beside it. Uh, you weren't playing around with matches, were you? No, Daddy. Oh, I got the shivers on that one. I wasn't. Jack paused for a moment and said, uh, Something strange is going on around here, and I'm going to get to the bottom of it. Now he got on the telephone and called the sheriff's office to see if his good friend Sheriff Thompson would come out and take a look behind the barn. Shortly after, uh, the sheriff and his deputy arrived and began to investigate the mysterious burnt spot. Oh, it looks like an alien spaceship landed behind your barn, <laughs> Sheriff Thompson said with a, with a chuckle. <laughs> yeah, they were probably grilling some steaks at the grill tipped over, burning your grass. Then the aliens drank a few beers, <laughs> put the fire out with their space boots, <laughs> and left. Jack laughed at the sheriff's jokes. <laughs> Maybe I'm making something of nothing, he said. Sorry to call you all the way out here for nothing. Oh, uh, don't worry about it, Jack. We'll be seeing you, Sheriff Thompson said. Oh, uh, oh, by, oh by the way, uh, keep me posted if those uh, beer-drinking aliens come back to, to grill out. Uh, 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 we'll, bring, we'll, bring some, uh, ha, we'll bring some hot dogs. <laughs> I kind of impressed myself with that one. Oh, the sheriff and his deputy sped off, and Jack went back to the house, and he sat down at the table and said, I think there's more to this spot behind the barn than the Sheriff Thompson made it out to be. Uh, and what do you think? Well, from what I'm hearing, you pretty much have your mind made up about the spot. Uh, maybe something strange did happen back there. Uh, have you found Trigger yet? Uh, no, honey, I haven't. It's not the first time the Trigger's uh, been gone. Uh, sometimes he wanders off for days. Yeah, I think I'll call Tom to look into this further. He's a UFO buff, and this will make him feel important and give him something to talk about. Well, Billy chimed in. Dad, do you think I could tag along and uh, be his reporter? Uh, I could take down notes. Yeah, sure, he replied. That sounds like a good idea. I think I'll go ahead and call Tom and see if he'll come on out and uh, take a look after you get home from school. Well, uh, Tom eagerly accepted the offer to come out and investigate. He, he packed his camera, radiation tester, wow, and test tubes, what? And headed out. Just test tubes? He arrived back on time and followed Jack back to the barn and said, I really hope you had a visit from the Greys. Tom looked confused. Hey, what do you, what do you, what do you mean the Greys? Uh, Greys are the most popular species of aliens that have visited our planet. Oh, they're over... 50 identified species that we're aware of uh, from top secret documents that have been leaked out over the years. Yeah, Jack had a look of skepticism and disbelief on his face, eh, but he left Tom to do his work. Uh, just give me a call eh, if you find something. And uh, when your lab results get back, Jack said, nah, sure thing, I'll be the first to know. If I discover real evidence of extraterrestrial visitors for another planet landing on Jack's farm, Oh, I'll be the envy of all ufologists in the world, exclamation point, Tom thought to himself. About a week later, Jack finally got a phone call from Tom. Hey, what'd, you, what, what'd you find, Tom? Well, after testing the soil, there were high levels of radiation, 
uh, and there were three circular uh, indentations on the ground. Ah, this, this leads me to believe that some sort of unidentified object landed on this spot and is responsible for the burned mark. Ah, with your permission, I'd like to show this to some of my most trusted colleagues uh, that are well known in their field. That sounds good to me, Jack said, still a little bit of a shock. Uh, Jack! Uh, if this evidence turns out to be of unknown origin, your life will change forever. Is your family up for this? You ready to get your off the chain? You ready to go crazy right now? Sure. We can use a little bit of tourism in this town. But there's something I want you to guard with your life and don't let anyone know if you have it. Not even your wife or Billy. What is it? Well, I don't know for sure, but if it looks like possibly some kind of alien probe was left behind, I'm afraid if I show it even to my fellow ufologists, word will spread. People will stop at nothing to have something like this. Uh, keep it locked up. Oh, don't bring it out until I say it's safe. Nah, don't worry, Tom, Jack said with a chuckle. <laughs> I'll, I'll keep it locked up. It's just a stick of metal. Yeah, good luck. And you keep me updated on your findings. Thank you. And I'll call you in the morning after I talk to my colleagues. Jack's life was about to take a turn for the worse. The alien probe was more deadly than it appeared. It, uh, it, it was a death ray that the aliens used to, uh, to, 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 to vaporize any living creature in thin air. Uh, Tom should have left the probe where he found it uh, because the aliens are on their way to retrieve this object at any cost. If humans could figure out how to operate this device and it got into the wrong hands, someone could annihilate the entire human race. This is a probe, right? I imagine, going with the stereotype of aliens, especially greys, uh, that the probe goes into the anus. And so here, they left their anus probe back in the field, and this little boy found it and he's just going to slip it into thousands of people's anuses and destroy the human race. I said thousands. I'm sure there's more people than that. Jack did as Tom instructed him and put the object into his wall safe. Well, that's nice. Next morning, Tom was so excited by the findings that he went straight to the phone to call Jack. Jack, uh, this is Tom. And the results are in from the investigation, exclamation points, my... My colleagues agreed that the high levels of radiation and circular indentations indicate a, indicate, a, indicate a visit from any extraterrestrial being. Tom went over the results in detail and made the request, uh, You need to bring the probe I gave you, even if it smells bad, in order to be 100% sure that it is extraterrestrial. How many anal probes are just lying around? We'll need to run tests on it. I need you to bring the object to this address for further analysis. This will be the last piece of proof we need. Uh, meet me around eh, 11 tonight. Kind of a weird time. Why so late? Well, he's answering my call. Uh, a good friend of mine uh, who has agreed to help us out uh, as soon as he's available. That's weird. What's he doing? Uh, don't be late. Don't worry. I'll be there. The Jack showed up at 11 o'clock on the dot and handed over the object, the Anos object. After careful analysis, Tom's technician friend uh, concluded that the object was of unknown origin. Yeah, but they know what it's used for. There are some markings on the object that look like hieroglyphics. It's definitely like nothing I've seen on this earth, except that it's an object with hieroglyphics which you see on Earth. As he said, he examined the object closely. I only thanked him for his time, and Tom instructed Jack to lock the object away again. I'll be releasing my findings to the local press. Prepare yourself. As soon as the press got the news, it was on the front page of the paper at the top story of every news station. Oh, the townspeople didn't waste any time driving by Jack's farm at night in hopes that the UFO would come back and that they could get a glimpse of a gray alien. Little did they know, the greys were on their way back for their death ray. When the trigger bit 
When Trigger, sorry, bit one of the alien's arms, it dropped the device. Oh, well, that explains that. Uh, the other alien wasted no time vaporizing Trigger. Oh, poor Trigger. But they got back to pick up its device again. A few nights later, uh, the alien spacecraft landed behind the barn undetected, and the gray aliens got out and, and shined, a, shined a bright light on the ground in search of the death ray. And when they could not find it, uh, they decided to pay Jack a visit and retrieve their property. Jack! And Tom were playing cards yeah, at the kitchen table with the door to the kitchen open. Before their eyes were the same two aliens that landed several nights before. Jack and Tom's jaws dropped, and they looked at each other bewildered. They were both frozen. The only way the aliens could communicate with humans was through telepathy. They said, eh, The reason we've come back to your planet is to take back what is ours. Our device is left behind when an animal attacked us. You know, an animal like my cat. Did you hear my cat? My cat's meowing. Son of a... Causing the animal to be vaporized. Vaporizing cats. We immediately boarded our ship and uh, went back to our planet called Zentar. Tom felt himself fill up with rage. Oh, he wasn't about to let these aliens take back the death ray. All Tom could see was dollar signs and all the fame that could have been his. He, he glanced over at the wall next to the table and he noticed that Jack had a, a set of samurai swords <laughs> mounted on the wall. Oh, this is getting Kill Billish right now. Tom inched over and gently took off uh, one off the wall. He put the sword behind his back and slowly walked up behind the alien. He was putting the death ray out of Jack's safe. Uh, with a great deal of force, Tom swung the sword at the alien's head and it flew off his shoulders. Oh, the other alien whirled around and saw what had happened. Uh, he pointed his death ray at Tom and he was instantly vaporized. Then the alien disappeared into thin air. Oh, that was an unfortunate ending. Uh, Jack ran outside and saw a bright light just over the hill next to the barn. He saw the craft hover over the barn, and in seconds, the spacecraft was gone. All Jack could do now was to tell the newspaper this wild alien story, but he knew no one would believe him. He would be the laughing stock of the town. He, Jack kept repeating to himself, no, Tom, no death ray, no story. He ran to Tom's car anyway to try to find any remaining evidence, but the car had disappeared, the whole car. Jack turned back and headed inside. He tried to force himself to sleep. As the days and weeks went by, no more onlookers came by, and the press had no interest in what Jack had to say about the little gray aliens. Tom, Tom went on the missing persons list, and no sign of trigger was ever found, so Jack tried his best to go on with his life. About ten years later, uh, Jack died, and the little gray alien story was buried with it. Billy recently got married and became a ufologist and decided to look into what Jack and Tom had discovered so long ago. However, with no hard evidence... He just kept his findings in a scrapbook underneath his bed alongside the memories of his father he so loved. Well, that got emotional towards the end. Uh, why don't we uh, go into the smoking room and review what the hell we just read? Well, now that we're settled in here in the smoking room, let's recap the stories you've read. Uh, the first story, the planchette. Uh, two people know that an entire family has been killed, drained of blood, and their eyes missing. And they say, oh boy, if we can get a hold of that planchette, we're going to make so much money. There's a whole thing there. We've seen enough ghost shows on TV where we know that if you hear a fable, it doesn't really necessarily mean it's true. But they say, uh, the whole world knows about this planchette and we're going to find it. And we're the only ones that have ever tried. And they're really specific. Uh, I'm going to go into the crypt. I'm sure it's there. The other one says, oh, I'm going to go find a secret room. I'm sure there's a secret room behind the library. And these things exist. And they do it. And they both die horrible deaths. Horrible deaths from a demon whispering at them that gave them more than ample uh, hints to get out with their lives. The 666, the whispering about the uh, cabinets and stuff, the, uh, the crowbar, uh, well, I'll just let it go. After that, the greys. 
The gray starts off as a, a little boy who has an entire cowboy outfit that he throws on at the drop of a hat when any adventure is afoot. Sees a light behind a barn, goes back there, a uh, dog gets uh, sucked up or whatever, killed, and uh, one of the aliens leaves their probe. It's called a probe, and we know what the probe is supposed to mean, uh, but it's also a death ray, which symbolic for certain people it's kind of kinks uh and uh they, they basically they get the, the later on other people get the probe and they hide it and the aliens come back for it and people die and then uh and then at the end of it uh, the one survivor just kind of grows old and uh, disappears and then there's kind of the fable of the uh missing probe uh what's good about these stories well, I miss Drock. I miss Drock von Stoller. Haven't heard a word from him. Uh, I actually messaged him months ago about these stories and uh, not heard a word from him, which makes me worry. So I hope he's doing good. Uh, his stories are weird uh, and funny and also got a spooky a spooky twist to him. What sucks? I haven't heard from Drock uh, ever since 2014. So uh, apparently October of 2020, he was doing fine, and I hope he's still doing fine. I'm worried about old Drock. Uh, what do we learn? If opportunity to become famous presents itself to you, whether through the form of uh, sexual aliens or uh, people who game too much, just uh, stay away from it. If you say, oh, these people died doing this thing, I'm going to be famous. Just stay away from it. Uh, somebody else, oh, I found this uh, sex device. Stay away from it. And I think we've learned, um, if anything, just, just sit your home quietly and just, uh, just mind your own business. But with that, I'm going to sit around worrying about the fact that I have only a week left to try to get trees torn down in my house or the city I live in is going to find me. All right, I'm going to move on. Thanks for listening, and uh, I will see you next week. Ah, uh, well, it appears you found me in the part of the podcast I hate the most, where I tell you all about the places on the internet where you can find me. Tell I hate this because of the sound effects making it sound like a stormy night uh, in the drawing room of the damned. Now nah, there's there's that. Uh, I I are you cool? I like cool people. It's the reason why I got involved in this business to begin with, just to meet cool people, not losers. So if you're cool, uh, feel free to go over to my website, uh, nuzzlehouse.com. You can see a backlog of everything I've ever read. Uh, along with episodes from the Book Boys and uh, blah, blah, blah. You can also find me on Instagram, uh, which is uh, House Nuzzle. And conveniently enough, uh, Twitter, which is also at House Nuzzle. Annoyingly, YouTube made me pick a name instead of just a House Nuzzle. So you got Glenn Nuzzles. So I guess you search for that if you want to watch a screen that doesn't do anything and just hear my voice. Uh... And since, uh, since I think you might be cool, you can always just email me directly. Glenn.nuzzles at gmail.com But don't, uh, don't email if you're a, a nerdlinger or a dork. Now, back to business. I can't believe I drank all of them already. There's gotta be one left.